So while this channel is not exclusively a tech channel, you've probably noticed that I like to review some gear. I like to talk sometimes about uh, the technology that makes videos like this possible. And today I want to talk about my trusty Micro Four Thirds camera by Lumix. Lumix being the uh, camera division of Panasonic. And specifically I want to talk about the sensor which underlies the uh, underlies, which makes videos like this possible, I should say. Underlies, I don't know why I tried to use the word underlies. The sensor which underlies the lens, which underlies the lens cap, which... Anyway, the point is, this is going to be a bit of a deep dive into the camera technology, which I choose to use. If you are not uh, technically savvy, if you are not a camera user yourself, this might not make a lot of sense. But I'm going to try to explain it, you know, there's something on the internet called E-L-I-F, which means explain like I am five. I'm going to try to explain like you are five, why I use Micro Four Thirds cameras. And why I think this camera is a great piece of technology that any new filmmaker should continu continue to consider. Uh, despite the fact that a lot of people online are saying that this is an outdated form of technology, that it's dead, that you should move on to the larger full-frame sensors. And, you know, you don't want to show the sensor too often because dust and stuff can get in there. But I want to show you for a moment what the Micro Four Thirds sensor looks like. The full-frame sensor will be larger. It will be another square or a rectangle, I suppose, but it will be larger and that will allow more light inside. And now, of course, if you are not a camera connoisseur, you will know that when you use your cell phone, for example, and you're filming video, sometimes in broad daylight, it will look pretty good and you'll be like, wow, I can't believe I did that with a phone. But if you ever tried to film something in a low light condition, um, or, you know, there's certain conditions where you really notice the difference and you're like, oh, this looks awful. Like, what? <laughs> I wish I had a real camera right now. That's because the sensor size is smaller. So this has a much smaller sensor than this. But this has a much smaller sensor than um, a $4,000 Sony camera like A7S III or something like that. And so it's all relative. But I would argue that even if you are someone who can afford the bigger full frame sensor, uh, there's a strong argument to be made for Micro Four Thirds, even in 2024, in a time when a lot of people are saying it's time to move past this. I'm sticking with this, and here's why. So, to begin with, when you have the larger sensor, as we talked about, you're able to allow in more light. This allows you to get more depth of field, which means more separation between you and the background. Um, just a quick side note, I'm not filming on Micro Four Thirds right now, I'm filming on a DJI Pocket 3. Um, so disregard the footage you're looking at right now. But as you can probably see, there's not too much separation between me and the background. There is a little bit. Like there is a bit of depth of field to this camera, which is kind of cool. You can, you can see it more clearly there. See how that bowl above my finger is very blurred out? And now it's in focus. So on full frame, you can get like really blurry backgrounds. And that's because the amount of light you're letting in, just it allows for optical tricks like that. Micro Four Thirds, it's a bit more difficult. And yeah, people see that as an advantage. But there is a disadvantage to having those big light field sensors, which is to actually, now again, I'm not an optical expert, but I can tell you that to actually cover that sensor with solid lenses, with solid glass in front, it, it, optically it needs to be much larger. And so this, which is a 12 to 60, which would be a 24 to 120 equivalent on full frame, I promise I won't throw too many numbers at you, but I want you to understand that to get the same lens size, the same footage that I'm looking at, you would need a lens which is like on Sony or Canon, it would be something like this. 
And so even if the camera body itself is the same size or relatively the same, the lens in front of it, which can easily add as much weight as the actual body, will be twice as big. Or sometimes it'll be three or four times as big. Look at this little cute little guy. This is a nine millimeter wide angle. This was released about a year ago. And as soon as I saw it, I picked it up because, oh, pardon me, I just dropped my uh, lens cap. The vein of every photographer, the lens cap. But if you look at this, Again, I'm totally like, I'm, I'm not exposing it properly or anything, but I just want to show you, this is a very nice um, lens for someone who is trying to talk to the camera, trying to get lots of width around my head. You know, even the current setup, you can see I don't have too much separation between my head and the top of the frame. But with this wide angle, it's super easy to get. And this lens weighs 105 grams, 110 grams, something like that. Like literally it is so small and so light. I mean, I could like, I could fit this in my pocket. Whereas a lot of those full frame lenses, uh, not only can you not fit in a pocket, like you, you put it in your backpack and you're like, oh my God, you put two of those in your backpack and you're like, you feel like you're a student again with a laptop and four textbooks. Like you're just like <laughs> lugging around this gear. And so the weight difference begins to make a huge impact when you're talking about multiple lenses, multiple camera bodies for some people. Um, but for me, you know, there are pros and cons to the bigger gear. Uh, I'll never forget the day when this was a wedding photographer, wedding filmmaker, one of those, someone who documents weddings. And she was telling me about how, I mean, at this point, I think I had a little point and shoot. This was before I had this camera. This I was pretty like new at my uh, filmmaking journey. And she was telling me about how she had just spent like $5,000 on this huge new camera and new lens setup. And she was talking about the investment and I was talking about how, I don't know, like I was showing some of the footage I could get with my tiny camera and she was admitting like, it's quite good. She's like, yeah, you could probably film a wedding even on something like what you have, but the perception of how the, the bride and groom and their family would see you, they'd be like, who is this guy with this tiny little camera? Like, why, why aren't I just filming it with my phone? That's what they would be thinking internally if they see you. And so when you have a big camera and a big lens, even if optically there's not so much difference from let's say the smaller camera with the smaller lens, sometimes in professional environments, um, you get perceived differently. And I mean, at the end of the day, that's like, it's like if you go to a basketball court you see someone with some old beat up shoes and you see someone else with like the new Air Jordans or like whatever, I, I don't know, like I guess Air Jordans kind of an old reference, but you know what I mean? Like the new expensive hip shoes, you're like, whoa, look at that guy. Like that's your first reaction. But then of course you wait for them to start playing and then you like, you know, you make a judgment about who's better. But when you're a filmmaker, they don't actually see the footage until days or weeks or sometimes months later. So it's kind of a different comparison because their perception of if you're good or bad, unfortunately, will come down to the gear in certain environments. And so for better or worse, I understand why some people want bigger gear in environments like that. In my situation, it's the opposite. In my situation, um, I work pretty much full time as a YouTuber right now. Uh, my main channel, for anyone who just stumbled on this video and doesn't know me, my main channel is The New Travel. It has about 330,000 subscribers and I film videos around the world. And I used to do more travel guides and travel vlogs, you know, more traditional travel content. I have 
moved almost exclusively into street interviews. So right now I'm interviewing people, strangers, about their life in cities in different places around the world. Um, and so, so this brings up a few things here. There's a few things to consider when I'm doing it, right? Of course, I want the footage to be as good as possible. And that's why I go with Lumix, which is a very well-respected uh, company. This is the GH5 line of cameras, the GH5 Mark II. And GH5 has been like an indie, low-budget video person's... Uh, what am I trying to say? It's been like beloved by indie filmmakers for many, many years. So this is not by any means a second rate camera. This is like a legendary camera that people speak of very highly. It's just that the technology is advancing so fast that in the last two, three years, there's like 10 new cameras I could consider if I wanted to leave the system behind. But I, I always ask myself, even if I had slightly better low light conditions or like slightly sharper image, whatever, like the huge lens does have its advantages sometimes, what would I be giving up? Here's a few things I'd be giving up. Number one, we already talked about, so I won't belabor this point, but like the weight when I'm traveling to different countries, um, I often try to go carry on only because I don't know. It's just if you have enough flights in your life, you know that occasionally your bag gets lost. That has happened to me. It happened to me on my way to Costa Rica in 2017. And it sucks when you lose everything in your bag and the airline is like not really taking responsibility for it at all, even though they were the ones who were supposed to get it to where you're going. And then you're stuck there with no clothes and you've lost like valuable things. Um, and also just the time of waiting for the bags and just... Yeah, as I said, the safety of having it with you. So as much as possible, I try to travel with carry-on, which means weight and size, every gram counts. So I try to have the smallest setup I can for convenience, for ease of travel. Um, but then there's another factor. There's two more factors to consider. Number one, as I explained about in a professional setting, the bigger camera makes people be like, whoa, this is a big production. We're getting our money worth on the streets when you're interviewing people who aren't used to being on camera and again these are these are like real people who I'm approaching who I mean it's always consensual if they don't want to be in the video they're not in the video no problem but even the people who agree like sometimes you can some people you meet are like just like super charismatic and like they like some people are just made to be on camera they're just very like non-conscious non-self-conscious people but some people, you can see, like, they, they're kind of looking at the lens and they're like, oh, like, this is, there's just a little bit of nerves about, like, the whole process because this is my camera. I'll have a little mic on top. Again, it's a small setup and I try to make it as casual as possible. But in a situation like this, a bigger lens and a bigger camera and a cage and, like, a second person, I think my rate of people saying no would, would skyrocket. Like, over 50% more people would say no. And those who say yes might be a bit more self-conscious, might not be as at ease with speaking with me, you know. So in my case, I mean, frankly, if I could get away with a phone, like it would be even... There is an argument to be made that maybe I should actually try to go even smaller. But um, I like being a filmmaker. I like zooming in on people in particular moments. I like, um, I like cameras. I'm not going to go to the phone. I think Micro Four Thirds is the sweet spot of high quality footage that separates itself from all that phone footage you see, but not, again, not spending $10,000 on some setup that is just heavier and more burdensome and more, well, more frightening if someone happens to rob me as well, which leads me to my final point, right? There's the weight, there's the size, there's a self-consciousness of people who are not used to being on camera. And then there's the, um, then there's the fact that some of these countries I travel to in Latin America or in the Eastern, in the East of Europe or 
I mean, I don't mean to generalize about parts of the world. Frankly, this could happen to me even in Canada on the streets of Montreal. Like th there are just thieves in certain places. Some places just have higher rates of pickpockets and stuff. And, um, you know, unfortunately, like South America, Central America, that's a place I know. I know a lot of travelers. A lot of people get robbed for their phones, their cameras. Some people I know have lost their passports, which is like a, you know, terrible situation to be in. When you have a bigger gear and you're traveling on your own for like a pickpocket, it's just like, hey, that guy. We're going to get a lot of money if we rob that guy. Now, it's not like this doesn't look expensive or classy or whatever, but it's just the bigger you get, the more, the more noticeable everything is, right? If I have a big setup and I have three lenses, I need a proper camera bag and stuff. Normally when I'm traveling like this just goes in a little cube, which yeah, I'll show you something real quick. I mean, I just have a couple of little things like this, which, you know, I can easily like, I can easily zip something like that up and put it inside a normal backpack. So my gear is like relatively protected, but from the outside, it doesn't look like I have a camera in it. If I'm riding on the train or something and I don't want to get more attention than I need. So it's the opposite of the wedding example. In certain examples, a big setup gets you attention and you want that. If you're a street photographer or you're doing street interviews or you're a traveler to countries where like security is more of a question, you want the smallest high quality gear you can get. And that for me is the selling point of Micro Four Thirds. It's that beautiful middle ground between the big expensive full frame gear and the cell phones, which as much as Apple wants to talk about how, oh, we filmed our whole production on the iPhone um, and everyone online seems to think that, you know, phones are capable of filming movies now. I think the truth is we all watch a lot of content on our phones and it's fairly apparent when you're watching something and it was filmed on a phone. Even if like some of the best phone quality looks good, you still subconsciously or consciously perhaps, you, you, you know when something was filmed on a phone and you don't see it as, as cinematic a process where I'm trying to create something somewhat cinematic. I'm trying to create an experience. I want a unique look. And I think the GH5 Mark II provides that for me. Am I afraid that I might be investing a lot of money into a system that, you know, as some people think is the past and maybe I should jump to full frame. Maybe I, maybe I will sometime in the next couple of years. I don't know. But for the time being, I'm very happy with my system. This camera has treated me very well. And, oh, by the way, with that channel I have, which has, you know, over 300,000 subscribers and countless thousands of comments on countless hundreds and hundreds of videos. Guess how many comments I've had telling me my quality isn't good enough. I should move to full frame or something like that. Zero. <laughs> Which is the last point I want to leave you with because I know that this kind of topic attracts people who are camera nerds, you know, and, I, and I'm a camera nerd too. That's why I'm making this video. I like to geek out about camera specs. It's fun. That's what leads people to wanting the latest and greatest gear. But at the end of the day, the average person watching on YouTube, they just want good content. They just want good content. And so you need to Forget about what all the camera viewers are saying about all the reasons you need the latest, greatest. You need to find something that you like the look of, you like the size of, you like the price of, you like the feel of, and get to know that camera, get to know that lens, and start making great videos or photos or whatever it is you happen to uh, excel at making. I guess this is kind of my defense of Micro Four Thirds. Uh, there's more technical stuff I could get into. Uh, I haven't even talked about stabilization, which is another thing for me, like the built-in stabilization on this camera in particular is nearly class leading. 
Um, but yeah, again, there's other videos talking about like all the specifics of stuff like this, but I just wanted to give a little overview of my experience uh, as a Micro Four Thirds shooter in 2024 at a time when many people seem to be jumping ship to full frame. Um, I have no intentions to do so. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a comment if you uh, have any thoughts on this subject to share and I will catch you next time. Peace.